Hi, this is Mrs. Roble. This is Chapter 8, Covalent Bonding, Part 1. In this video, we're going to look at how does the octet rule apply to atoms that form covalent bonds. And then we're going to look at single, double, and triple bonds. We'll also look at sigma and pi bonds. And then lastly, we'll look at covalent bond with its length and dissociation energy. So in the previous chapter, we were looking at ionic compounds. Now we're looking at non-ionic compounds. And when you think about it, um, these are atoms where the electrons share electrons. So they're not transferring electrons, they're together holding on to the electrons together. Um, as a result, we call this a covalent bond. And we also use the term molecule when two or more atoms together form a covalent bond. Now here I have an example of diatomic molecules, and I'll talk about the upside down L that's part of the periodic table. Um, the interesting thing that happens with a covalent bond is that we're looking at the force of repulsion and the force of attraction. And there's like a sweet spot that exists when those two atoms come together. And if you notice on the very right of this, um, picture at the bottom, it's almost as though they are okay with the fact that they're very close to each other, but they're not so close that they're pushing apart from each other. And when that happens, we have what we call a covalent bond. Now, the arrangement that exists between two atoms is essentially a net attraction. So please remember, that the electrons are attracted to the positively charged nucleus and as a result of it you have a homeostasis where the two electrons reside outside of the nucleus but they're still strongly attracted to the nucleus and you have a net um, gain of attraction. Okay, so we're going to talk about Lewis structure in part of this chapter. And please remember, with Lewis structure, we talked about it in a previous chapter, we're looking at valence electrons. So we need to know how many electrons are in the outer orbit or outer shell of the atom. And if you look at group 17, so it's one of those second to last columns in the periodic table, notice that there are seven valence electrons, and they tend to form covalent bonds with typically um, other non-metals. Okay, if you go to group 16, so one over from group 17, um, notice that they have six valence electrons. And oxygen, which is found in group 16, um, because it has two empty spaces, it would like to have two more electrons. As a result of it, it forms two covalent bonds, such as water. All right, so group 15, so that's the third column over. Um, they form three covalent bonds. And notice in nitrogen, it's got space for three more valence electrons. And as a result of it, it will form a covalent bond with another atom to give it that octet or that eighth set of electrons. And then group 14, where carbon resides. So we're talking about four four columns over, there's four empty spaces. And as a result of those four empty spaces, carbon wants to have a total of eight valence electrons. So it forms four covalent bonds with another atom. Okay, so you may hear the term sigma bond. Sigma bond is essentially one covalent bond. And please note, when you look at the examples here, we have water, we have ammonia, and we have methane. They all together have a single covalent bond with hydrogen, okay? With water, there's two. With ammonia, there's three. And with methane, there is four um, sigma bonds. Notice the purple, that is not a sigma, sigma bond. That is a non-bonding pair of electrons. Okay. There are actual double bonds, and with double bonds, we typically have two covalent bonds that are overlapping. So notice that oxygen 
it forms two covalent bonds. And as a result, there are four electrons that are being shared in that region. Triple bond, so we could have a triple bond. So a triple bond, we essentially have three overlapping covalent bonds. So notice with nitrogen, you essentially have a total of six electrons that are being shared, or three pairs. Now, with a two or three bonded atom, we have what we call a pi bond. So a pi bond is actually a different type of bond. So if you look at this um, picture that's at the very bottom here, between the two carbons is what we call a sigma bond. It looks like a little circle with a tail on it, and that represents the single covalent bond. Then over that single bond is what we call pi bond. So a pi bond is usually in the space above or the space below it, and it is a different type of bond, but it's typically found in double or triple bonds. Now to move into another section here, um, not just looking at types of bonds, so we have pi bond, we have sigma bond, we actually can look at strength of bonds based on bond length. So how long is that area where the two electrons are being shared? So if you increase the length, the attraction with those two atoms decreases. So it's harder for them to share those two electrons. So if you notice in that chart there, F2 is one single bond, and notice that its length is the longest. Whereas oxygen, O2, is actually a sigma and a pi bond, and it's a shorter bond. And as a result of it, okay, it's gonna be a stronger bond. And then lastly, we have N2. N2 is essentially one sigma bond and two pi bonds, and its length is even shorter. And as a result of it, its strength is higher. So what does that mean? That means that it's easy to break apart a F2 molecule, whereas nitrogen, N2, it's very hard to break it apart because it has shorter bond length. And as a result of it, the energy that you need to break it apart is very high. Okay, so what does this mean? As a result, covalent bonds, we're looking at atoms that share one or two or even three pairs of electrons. And please remember, when you have one pair of electrons, we call that a sigma bond. If you have two pairs of electrons or more, it's typically a sigma with a pi bond. And remember, a triple bond would be one sigma and two pi bonds. So what happens is the sigma bond is typically in the plane of the atoms that are sharing the bond, and then the pi bond overlaps either above or below that plane. And then lastly, we look at bond length. Bond length, we're essentially looking at how far away is the distance between those two atoms. And the further the atoms are away from each other, the weaker the bond.